second day of the Green Life Food Festival, especially for those of you who haven't, or for whom this is the first day. Uh, my name is Roy Gibbon. I work in the education department here at Shumay America. Shumay America is a spiritual organization that is dedicated to creating heaven on earth. And we do that through a number of ways. One is through a spiritual healing practice called Jore. Another one is through natural agriculture, which is a spiritual-based form of farming and gardening that honors nature. And the other one is valuing and promoting beauty, beauty in the arts, beauty in the environment. And the theme for this Green Life Food Festival is healthy food for all. Healthy food for all. So, I would ask you, how do we ensure that we get healthy food? How do we ensure? And can we have healthy food if our environment is not healthy? If our environment is not safe? And can we have a healthy environment if we lack ecological awareness? If we lack ecological awareness. And what do I mean by ecological awareness? That is the ability to see the big picture. To see the big picture. So first of all, uh, what is healthy food? We're going to have a panel discussion about this later today, by the way, in the, in the hall. So what is healthy food? To be brief, healthy food, in my opinion, is food that is free of chemical and other contaminants, and that is full of nutrition and is fresh. And what is what is a clean environment? I guess before I go to what is a clean, clean environment, how many of you here are concerned with the environment today? Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of problems and it seems to be getting worse and worse. We have chemical pollution everywhere in our skies, in our water, in the earth. We have radiation in, in the oceans. We have oil spills in the oceans. Um, our food is getting toxic. Our personal care products are getting toxic. Uh, it's just everywhere. There's electromagnetic pollution, and it seems to be getting worse and worse. So we're getting to be at a crisis, a crisis for possibly for human and planetary survival for life on Earth. So it's a very imp important thing. And some people feel like, well, I know things are getting bad. I'm going to move out into the mountains or the jungles or someplace to get away from it all. And maybe you could do that 50 years ago. But now, it seems like everything is so interconnected and pollution is going everywhere that even for those survivalists, that may not work anymore. Does water stay in any one place? Let's say you have a well or you're getting water from an aquifer and you're up in the mountains. Will that keep you safe? Does water stay anywhere? Water moves around through rain and wind and water comes up from the ground and it just goes everywhere. If you can't get clean water, can you get clean food? So we have to develop ecological awareness in order... So in other words, humanity as a whole, we need to agree that the environment, ecological safety, is possibly our number one concern for our survival. We can't have healthy food if we don't have a healthy environment. So how can we develop this group awareness that the environment a clean environment is our, possibly our top priority. So I would say we need to develop ecological awareness. Ecological awareness. And what I mean by that is to see things from a larger perspective. To, to see how does my actions affect everyone around me? And how does so, the society, how does it affect me and my friends? How does the environment affect everyone? How does the social and political institutions affect everyone? How do our cultural values affect everyone? It's all connected. So the ability to see how everything is interconnected and how everything we do affects everything is what I would call ecological awareness, when you see the big picture. I can't be an organic farmer or a natural agriculture farmer if the water I'm, I'm irrigating my plants with has all these chemical pesticides in it. I can't, uh, also can't be a, 
a healthy farmer if the skies are full of poisons that are coming down from the, from the air. It's, we can't separate ourselves at all. So how do we develop ecological <coughs> awareness? That would be, anybody have an idea? How would we develop ecological awareness? How do we start to look at the big picture? Spending more time in nature. Spending more time in nature, that would help. Yes, that's right. Anyone else? Look at all the connections from food to health to... So you can study those things, read about it and think about it, yes? Uh -huh. Developing a spiritual practice because? Because it helps to raise your awareness. Raises your awareness uh -huh. or expands your awareness, yes. Uh -huh. And wherever we learn, hopefully we can spread it somehow, find a way that we enjoy disseminating the knowledge. Share the knowledge, thank you. Sure. Yeah. So to me, one of the things that prevents us from having ecological awareness is greed, greed and selfishness. Mm -hmm. Greed, what does greed do? When you have greed, you say, this is what I want, and I don't care about anything else. So you actually, it's a form of ignorance. Don't confuse me with the facts. I don't want to know that. This is what I want. <laughs> so we have to let go of greed, greed and selfishness for our survival. If you're truly greedy and you want to live a healthy life, you, have to, you can't just grab what you want anymore because the earth is like a burning ship. It's going to go down. So you can't really have it enjoy your large mansion or your, your yacht if everything is going to go to hell. You have to, you know, it doesn't work anymore. It might have worked 50 years ago, but if you're truly selfish and greedy, you go, we've got to save the planet or all the stuff I have won't matter. Right? It's, it's simple. So we, hit, we have to go beyond greed and selfishness. Another thing I'd say is we need to go beyond what I call the either or mind. It's either this or it's that. Either you're right or I'm right. We have to go beyond cons uh, the left, leftist polo political philosophy and the right political philosophy. Each has something to say that's true, and each has things to say that are, are wrong. Well, even right and wrong, we, in other words, we have to have dialogue with each other. Rather than saying, I'm right and you're wrong, we have to listen with an open mind and an open heart. We have to think beyond the environment or my own needs all these separations. Either or is not a way to see the big picture. And finally, I think we need to sometimes get out of our mind and all of our opinions and our facts and to quiet the mind and go out in nature, as Pauline said, and just look at what's going on. Look at things. You know, sometimes we think we, we know, but, so, but sometimes we have to let that go. To learn new things, we have to stop thinking about our, what we already think we know. So those are three things, and there's probably a lot of other ways to develop ecological awareness. Pra so practicing planting, you know, if we practice nurturing life forms, like plants. So get out into nature, yes. Take a walk in nature, cultivate a garden, do something that gets you in touch with the earth, which people say is our mother, the mother earth. So within Shume, as I said, we are promoting natural agriculture, but we are, we are in great appreciation for various forms of organic farming because al that's also very good for the environment. But we are in particular focusing on natural agriculture, which I'll talk about soon. Um, let's see. OK, I want to go back to Shume. So Shume focuses on natural agriculture, Jori, which is a spiritual healing practice, and the arts. And we want to bring spirituality into the way we farm. We want to bring beauty into the farm. And we want to bring ecological awareness into the farm. Why? Because it's part of our survival. I don't think we can farm purely just to make money or purely just to create food, because that's not the big picture. We have to think about how it affects the environment. By the way, did you know that? There's about the same percentage of people in this country in the food industry now as there was 100 years ago. About a similar amount of people working in the food industry. And what I mean by food industry, back in, let's say, 1920, over, I think over about half the population was working in, as farmers. It might not be quite that, but it's a large, large percentage. 
And, uh, and now we find that less and less people are doing actual farming. So they say, well, we're, we're so productive with modern farming because look how few people make all this food. But if you look at wh how the farming industry has changed, in the past people had these mom and pop type farms and they had some of the family members and friends helping them with their tractor and their cows and it was, they weren't that big except for maybe the wheat farms and the corn farms. But now we have these huge agri-businesses and they have lots and lots of machines and the average food now goes, is it like 1,500 miles is shipped, shipped, food is shipped far away. It used to be most, most people ate food that came within a couple hundred miles away at best, 100, 100 years ago. But now we need factories to produce all this farm equipment and airplanes that are spraying pesticides and it's a lot of machinery. That's part of the farming industry. So we used to just say we had farmers, now we have a farming industry. So we have all these people making machines. It takes a lot more petroleum, gas to fuel all that. That's part of the, indirectly part of the farming industry, at least as far as the amount of gas that's used. The trains and the trucks ship everything all over the place. And uh, the people who, companies that produce pesticides and fertilizers, we didn't use so much back then, if any at all. And then there's warehouses where they store all the food to ship it from here to there to there to there. And there's big accounting firms inventory firms, um, what else is there? There's advertising agencies, and then there's all the processed food. Most food, you'd buy it at your local um, store or farmer's market or vegetable stand. We had a lot of vegetable stands back then, and you cooked it yourself. There wasn't that much pre-made processed food. People went to restaurants a lot less than they do now. So there's all the food processing industry, which is huge. Again, more advertising, more shipping, more processing, manufacturing, it goes on and on. And then there's all the waste that's involved with taking all the refuge from the packaging and everything and putting that somewhere, and it goes on and on. So if you add all that up, there's about the same percentage of people working in food now as there was 100 years ago, except that our food is not as healthy as it was back then. It used to be, it was all organic 100 years ago pretty much. And it was local, it was fresh, and people had a, a lifestyle of a, a, a living that you could feel like I'm actually making something that's contributing to society. society. I'm making healthy, fresh food for the people, and I know a lot of the people who buy my food from me if I have a farm stand. So it, it was a different world. And we had a lot of small towns that were, had a good economy. It's all changed, everything's gotten uh, centralized. But the main thing is that the, the most important thing is that this modern food industry is poisoning the water, poisoning the land, and poisoning the food, and it has very little nutrition. And now people, everyone's an employee for some giant corporation rather than having small independent businesses, which we had before, which was the foundation of this country 100 years ago. So people had worthwhile jobs that they felt th that was contributing. So anyway, that's back to the need for better farming. So um, how many of you here prefer conventional farming, by the way? And it's, uh, I just had to ask that. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. You can raise your hand down if you want. That's like a no. Okay. Um, okay, I have another question. How many of you think that we, we need conventional farming to food to to feed everyone on the planet. Can we c create enough food with organic farming and natural agriculture farming and those kinds of farming to feed everyone? Some yes. people say, no, you can't. What do you think, Alice? They actually, you, you have enough food right now. It's the matter of distribution. Yes. And the matter of, you know, spoilage. That's right. So That's right. it's actually, we are part of the solution. We are producing enough food. More than enough food for everyone, right. for all seven and a half billion people. Exactly. Yes. Ben. Remember when they did the Victory Gardens in the 1940s? During the uh, World War II. The FDA mm -hmm. was like, or the USDA, and then we were like, well, we're not going to be able to produce enough food to manage that, but they ended up producing the same amount of food that the entire conventional farming society. Really? I didn't know that. It was kind of a shock for everybody in that period of time as well. Victory Gardens were a good example of what we talked about. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Well, 
during, uh, in the Soviet Union, same kind of thing, well, not quite the same, but they had these big um, communal farmings, I guess they called them, they were huge like ours, and they weren't able to produce enough food, <coughs> so they encouraged people to have gardens, and most people lived in big apartment blocks, but they had places where they could have gardens, and everyone had their own, and they produced enormous amounts of specially uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, and that's where people got it, because the other farms were not efficient enough. And people, if you have your own garden or farm, you really want to do well because it's your garden. You want it to produce well, you're going to work hard, and you want it to be good. Yes, Star? I want to support that. There's a fantastic series of books with um, a woman in Russia called Anastasia. Oh, yes, right. By Vladimir Megre. The website, everyone write it down, please trust me, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Ringing ringingcedars.com, like a cedar tree with yeah. edible cedar nuts, yeah. plural, cedars. Cedar it's a, those are very cedar. spiritual books, yes. Yes, and she uh, talks about that, the, the, they call it dacha, those gardens. That's right, like the dachas. people live in Moscow, but they have a summer garden plot land out, out mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and then she talks about what you're saying about the heart. She, her vision is that every country in the world gives every citizen, I think like five acres per person, to have a very small, humble home and a huge organic garden. And then they'll put their love into the garden for the, the, the fresh organic food they're eating, Thereby, they're going to heal the earth by putting love into the earth, and then the whole earth will be, like you say, shoemade plant, um, heavenly paradise, peace on earth. That's close to natural agriculture, the idea about putting your love into the soil, into the plants, and what you do. So if you love your work, it makes all the difference in the world. She recommends reading her books, Outdoors and Nature. That sounds good, too. I read them all. <coughs> there we go. It's one of the greatest experiences of my life. Thank you. Thank you. So they, they produced a lot. Without these people having their gardens, they would have starved. It was that important for them and people are happy doing it. When you have these big firms, uh, are you as motivated to work real hard and you get every, pick everything you, you need? You're not as motivated because it's not yours. But if it's your farm, you're gonna work harder and you're gonna want it to be good. Yeah. So I wanna compare the difference between conventional farming, organic farming, and natural agriculture natural agriculture farming. You could also say gardening, organic gardening and natural agriculture gardening. I got this chart, by the way, from Deguchi Sensei, who is the, the head of the natural agriculture department in Japan uh, a while ago. It was at Shumi's headquarters over there. He gave a class for Atsushi and I. Atsushi's here somewhere, I think. He's outside. Anyway, he's right out there. <laughs> and uh, let's see now. So. Should I use a laser pen or should I just laser pointer or should I just use my fingers? Let's test the pointer first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Works? Okay, there we go. All right, so this looks complicated and yes, it, it actually is. <laughs> 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 so these are, um, this row is talking about conventional farming. This is organic farming. Let's use a pointer. And this is natural agriculture farming. And these are the categories we're looking at. Does, do, they use convent, do they use chemical fertile pesticides, yes or no? Do they use organic pesticides, yes or no? Do they use chemical fertilizers, yes or no? Organic fertilizers, yes or no? Conventional seeds, yes or no? Organic seeds, yes or no? Does conventional farming use chemical fertilizers? Yes. Chemical fertilizers would be like NPK, um, potassium, phosphorus, and uh, nitrogen. Yes, thank you. And and probably some other ones I don't know about, I'm sure. And does conventional farming use organic fertilizers? Yeah, they use manure sometimes and part of parts of plants and things. And uh, how about seeds? Does conventional agriculture <coughs> use conventional seeds? Yes, they usually buy it from big companies such as Monsanto and Dow or DuPont. Anyway, they, they buy conventional ones. And now so many of the seeds they buy are GMO seeds, which is not very good for you. And do they use organic seeds? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I think they do. I'm not sure about that, but you know, they buy what they can. Not everything's conventional. How about organic farming? Do they use chemical pesticides? No, thank God. Thank God they don't use that. Well, I can't be sure about that um, because, uh, you know, you've, have, has everybody here, here heard about Roundup? probably. Mm -hmm. Roundup, it's glyphosate. It's very toxic pesticide and they, u they spray that on most genetically modified organisms, gen genetically modified crops. 
But now what they're also doing is uh, with wheat crops. When it's time to harvest wheat, it's, you can get maybe 90% of the wheat that you can harvest. About 10% is not quite ripe, it's still green, so they don't get everything. But what they found now is that they spray everything just before they harvest it with Roundup. It desiccates the crops, it makes them dry up, and they can get 100% of the wheat. But the trouble is, you have Roundup, which is very toxic. It's on your wheat. And I've, I've read different things. Some people say that even some organic wheat gets sprayed with that before it's, pr before it's gone out, and some say it doesn't. So I don't know what's true. Does anybody know if that's true? A lot of the new farming, especially in uh, wheat and the like, will uh, spray with the glyphosate about two weeks before they harvest because it dries the plant. Yeah, desiccate. Do you know if they do that to organic wheat? Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are doing it. That's what I thought, which should be against organic rules. Yeah, but it's still, but now we have, the trouble is, as the amount of people buying organic, pr organic food is going up, up, up. So now the big companies, the big giant farming industries are starting to get into or organic farming. Do, they, do you think they really care that much about the soil or they just want to make profits? Now, um, the way the capitalist system works is you have big corporations and the corporations have to make money for the shareholders. That's the way capitalism works. And, and I'm not criticizing capitalism, but it has some problems. And when you have a corporation, if that's the only motive is to make money for the shareholders, then if someone says, well, we need to take, take care of the land and the soil and we have to make healthy food for people, no, that's not our job. Our job is to make money for the corporation. That's our only job. So when you have a, corpora a large corporation creating organic farm, they really have a different motive than people who have private farms. Very different, and that's the system we have. You can't go away. If the CEO says, let's just cut our profits by 10% and make healthy food and protect the land and the soil, can they do that? <laughs> They'll get fired. <laughs> they sometimes can't even lower the, the profit 1%. So it's a system we have. I don't know of a better system than uh, capitalism. I'm not saying we should junk it, but it has some problems. Because capitalism makes lots of things we need, but it's also poisoning the land and it's poisoning us. So I don't know a way out of it. Someone smart has to find a, a different solution. Um, and I've heard of some, but you know, I, I don't want to get into that yet or today. So um, there we have people that say they're <coughs> organic farmers and they're spraying stuff with chemicals. So what do you do? You know, so even you can't just say, oh, it's organic. We can't be sure anymore. So we'd have to do the best we can. So anyway, organic, do they use chemical pesticides? For now, I'll say no. Do they use organic pesticides? Yes. So what would be some organic pesticides that uh, organic farmers would use? You, ben, you, you could probably answer that. No, actually, I don't know. You don't? I, I don't get involved too much in the organic. I'm You're more permaculture. Um, I'm more what the plant likes. I like to listen to my farm and my plants, and, and they have no interest in that stuff. So there we go. So you listen to them because you listen to the plants because they're my friends. <laughs> 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 that doesn't I, sound I, like no, because you know, like understanding what kind of home they have, understanding how they like to work upon that helps me to bake a better place for them. And when they're happier, they produce better for me because they want me to be happier so that I can better produce their home for them. So it's kind of a relationship with friendship. You sound like a natural agriculture farmer. Yeah. <laughs> So what, when you say that you know, they, they like this and they don't like that and they want you to be happy and so on, so some people would say that you're anthropomorphizing them. You, it sounds like you think they're conscious, intelligent beings that you can communicate with. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but you know, you take like, you I always it. use the example of the orange because the orange has a vitamin C and it's such a metabolism that it's only absorbed by two um, animals on the entire planet, one of which being a human. But why did it have to waste its time coming up with this idea of being bright orange and having vitamins that only one group had, unless it was consciously trying to get us to plant it? I like that. So that's one of the principles of natural agriculture, is the belief that all of nature is conscious, intelligent, and sensitive. Conscious, intelligent, and sensitive, which means you can talk to your plants and they can hear you. 
and they can make an intelligent response. That's very different than a factory farm where you're just like mowing them down and spraying them and chopping them up and it doesn't matter because we think they're just things. But if you think, well, it's an intelligent universe, not only intelligent, they're sensitive, they feel things, and they can respond to us. That's a different thing. Then how you, you're going to treat things differently because of that. So that, that's one of the things that makes natural agriculture farming different than organic farming in that we believe everything is conscious, intelligent, and, nature, and sensitive. Now, some organic farmers believe that, but as a general rule, it's, it's not talked about. But if you think that not only are the plants alive and conscious and sensitive, but even the soil and the air, everything around you responds to your thoughts and feelings, yeah. well then, okay, not only do they respond, but we believe that the attitude of the gardener or farmer affects the plants. It affects the ecosystem. So if you, if you farm or garden with love or gratitude, your plants will do very well. So I, I'm kind of going ahead of myself, but we got off, to, on, off track here. Um, we'll get back to that. So where are we on organic? So organic pesticides, organic farms use organic pesticides. So I think they use things like cayenne pepper, garlic, diatomaceous earth, um, there's a few other natural things you use that are not toxic, but the idea is that you still have to fight the bugs. You know, you're kind of in a bit of a battle there. They're eating our food and we've got to protect it. And chemical, do they, does organic farming use chemical fertilizers? No. Well, not usually. They might use NPK sometimes. I'm not sure about that. They might use rock dust and uh, recycled uh, plant waste. And uh, what else? Fish, fish mulch and things. And, well, and technically, if they're doing manure and cattle are eating yeah. chemicals or whatever. Yeah. Technically, it should be organic manure. Mm -hmm. Technically, yeah, that's right. But you think the big organic factory farms are really being that careful. Not if they can get away with it, they won't. And you think the agencies are really monitoring them that closely? Probably not, there's no budget. So who can say? So if we're thinking, when we say organic, we think about the mom and pop farms are probably doing pretty well. But the big factory farm, organic farms, it's hard to say. You can open that door if you want, the one on the right, so people can hear. Oh, it opens inwards. Oh, maybe we can push that open a bit. So we're taking a door opening break. And it'll get a little more fresh air in here. Yeah. Good idea. Thank you. There should be a door stopper there that, that would keep it open. That one can open. There's a door stopper somewhere down there. Yeah. There should be a door stopper on that side too that would keep it open. Okay, so back to organic. So uh, if anybody knows of other organic fertilizers that, that are used, let me know. Otherwise, we'll move on. And okay, how about does, does organic farming, do they buy conventional seeds? They try not to, but sometimes they do because that's all they can get. I have a question about that. If they do, <coughs> um, I hope that they're getting the ones that will be like like what Shume says in the natural seed saving. Yeah. Because Monsanto, I heard, is being kind of tricky to me, but where they're actually creating the seeds on purpose to be non viable Those are called terminator seeds. They'll grow plants, but if you take the seeds from that plant and put it in the ground, it won't work. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. sterile. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's they right. Can get everyone dependent <coughs> on them as the only source. And some places are trying to ban seed saving. It's crazy, huh? You can't have your own seeds? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just curious if there do if Monsanto has not yet taken over the whole conventional seed production. Uh, well, what the big uh, you know if there's other people who are creating conventional seeds that are still viable that, that will grow a plant that will grow viable seed fruit. Yeah, I don't I don't know the exact details, but I know that these big companies are buying out more and more of the seed seed producing and seed sellers, people who sell seeds. So it's we're getting more tricky. 
And then when they have enough money, they can buy out politicians to make the law saying, Yeah, that's, that's how the world is. You can't illegally grow the kind of seeds that will buy, you can't do seed saving. So greed makes people ignorant. Yeah. All they care about is money. They don't care about the consequences of their action. And that's why we need to move to ecological awareness when we see the big picture. We need to do that as a human race. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I was reading not too long ago that the conventional farmers um, in the Midwest, a lot of the big corn uh, growers are actually moving towards non-GMO because the GMO seeds are more expensive. You well, know, that's what's happening. A lot of the big farms are moving to no-till. Yeah, so there is kind of this, you know, this uh, um, knowledge going through the farming community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Billy. Yeah. Billy has a farm up in Washington State, an organic <coughs> and natural agriculture farm, or is it all natural agriculture? Natural. natural agriculture. So yes, what's happening is um, more and more people are re realizing that GMO crops are not really financially viable. The promise was that GMO seeds were, would, would produce much more food than other seeds, and uh, the Roundup would kill all the bugs, it was very effective, and you'd make a lot of money. But it turns out that GMO seeds do not produce more food than, hi Barbara. Hi there, Roy. <laughs> they do not produce more food than, than other crops. But you have, to, you have to buy your seeds every year, you have to buy more and more pesticides, because each year, what happens with Roundup is the weeds are starting to develop resistance to the pound Roundup. So they have to create, you have to spray more and more and more. So you're spending more money on that. <coughs> and, uh, and meanwhile, you're getting sick, the farmers are getting sick, and the food is toxic, and they're losing money. So that's, it may be one of the ways ecological awareness will come back to us is we're all going to start suffering the effects of not just toxic farming, but a toxic civilization. Mm -hmm. how, what about how many people are getting sick from all sorts of immune system problems that we didn't have even 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. The rate of autism is unbelievable, but that's another story. Uh, but there's all sorts of problems that people are getting from toxicity. Star. Um, about the Monsanto, I heard that they've also developed a, 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 a seed food thing like with certain grains um, that the pesticide is contained in the seed itself. That's so right. So if the bugs go and, and, and eat it, it um, then it explodes their stomach. That's right. So, but we are also creatures. So if we eat it, it's digging holes, in, it's biting holes in our stomach, even though we're bigger, but then it's causing health problems due to that yes, effect. Yes, that's right. Um, GMOs are destroying the gut bacteria. So a lot of people are having digestive issues now because of GMO. It's, well, it's not GMO, well, it's because of Roundup particularly. And then they have candida, they have allergies, they get headaches, they, they have malnutrition because they can't absorb things, they have no energy, it goes on and on and on. So digestive problems, allergies, immune system problems, it's a direct result of toxins. Not just from that, from other things in the air too, but especially digestive, so that's, that's right. So anyway, so seeds, all, these are, all of the seeds are big topics that we can go on for a long time about, but let's move on. <laughs> so how about organic? Um, Organic farmers, do they buy organic seeds? Yes, sometimes. Some organic farmers save their seeds and some buy. So it's a combination. So now we go down to natural agriculture, NA. And does natural agriculture use chemical pesticides? No, never. Does natural agriculture use organic pesticides? Usually not. Sometimes I've heard they do a little bit when they're desperate, but usually no. How about does natural agriculture use chemical fertilizers? No, never. Does natural agriculture use organic fertilizers? Um, I've heard of a few, but basically no. It's not supposed to. Does, do natural agriculture farmers use conventional seeds? No. Uh, well, maybe they might buy them occasionally, but very rarely. Basically, conventional farmer, natural agriculture tries not to buy seeds at all. They try to either well, first save their seeds, but if they have to get it for at, at the beginning, they may buy it from an organic farmer, or they may ask a, a neighbor if you can give them, give them some. And not only do they try to get organic seeds, they try to get heirloom seeds. 
Do, does everybody know what heirloom is? What's an heirloom? An heirloom is a crop that's been growing in the same region for a long time, so it, it starts to evolve and adapt to the local area. So you might find tomatoes grown in Southern California are very different than tomatoes grown in I Iowa or in Pennsylvania. They have a different color, different shape, different taste, and they have different names. Look at all the different apple varieties we have. Those names represent different regions and different soil conditions. They used to be called heirloom apples. Some of them now are so massively done that I don't know what that means. So you want, you want local seeds that are free of, of pesticides. So you want to, and if you're a, a natural agriculture farmer, you want to also share your seeds with other natural agriculture farmers. Now, what's the profit motive in doing that? to share them with your neighbors. There isn't any one. So why would you do it? Because you have ecological awareness. Mm -hmm. You're not so greedy. You're thinking about the big picture. Yes, I need to make money as a farmer. I need a good income. But I also need to have a safe environment around me. I want as many people around me to do, become organic farmers or natural agriculture farmers rather than conventional ones because I'm sharing the air and the water with my neighbors. And I want them to be happy. We want to create a movement, so you want to share. So it's not always about profits, it's about sharing and thinking about the big picture. That's an ecological awareness, or you could call it generosity. So anyway, um, organic seeds, you generally don't want to buy, even buy uh, organic seeds, you want to save them. So why, why is it so important to save seeds and grow them again? Is it important, or why don't you just buy seeds every year? Anybody have any idea? Develop a relationship with those seeds. Those seeds develop a relationship with the soil? Yes. That's right. The seeds develop a relationship with the soil. So, um, vice versa. Yes. So, this is, um, let me see now. I want to get into one of the principles of. Also, so we become self reliant in, in the cycle of life. You know, so. Uh -huh. Yes. You know, so we're not dependent on some distant thing being shipped in, like we can keep it going sustainably on, in a self-reliant way right there. So, yes, uh, Ben, yeah, thank you. Just one small, because you know, I plan to be a farmer for the next 50 years of my life, and I plan to hopefully take that on to my family and off to their family, and I hope to do so in the same spot for a long time. You know, some plants start to grow up with a relationship over a long time, over several generations, and start to become accustomed to one particular Which area. is an heirloom. Mm -hmm. I'm always They become stronger. They become stronger and they mm -hmm. become more satisfied. That's right. Eventually, they become better Up in, uh, there's a place more called, resilient. more resilient, thank you. There's, a, there's something called Walla Walla Washington onions mm -hmm. that you can only get in southeastern Washington state. They're so sweet, people eat them like apples. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, they're really something. You know, who's thinking someone's eating an, an onion? <laughs> 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 I want a bite, give me. But they only ship them in that area. You can't get them in California. They're only regional. That's it. That's all you can do. So if you want Walla Walla Washington onions, some people call them apples because they're so sweet. You have to go up there. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the, what is the, the primary principle in natural agriculture is to farm or garden as close as possible to nature, to the way nature grows things. But, oh, oh, okay, so for instance, um, if you go down to the Amazon jungle, is anybody plowing the, the land there? Uh, are people planting palm trees and cycads and bromeliads? Nope. Is people, are people adding fertilizer and manure? <laughs> are people rotating the crops over there? You know, it's, it's, a, it's doing fine, right? How about the big forests in like northern Canada or Siberia? No, things are going. So where, where are they getting all their food? I mean, no one's adding manure and, and, <laughs> and, and compost and mulch and stuff. What's going on? So we want to grow things as close to nature as possible, but still 
things that will satisfy our needs. Now, you could s first of the question is, are humans separate from nature? We think we are, though, don't we? We act like we are. So that's what ecological awareness is, is to realize that I am a part of nature. I am natural. But do we think naturally? If we, think, if we don't think naturally, we don't act naturally. If we don't act naturally, we mess up the environment. But our need for certain kinds of foods is part of a natural process. Every species has its own. So maybe farming and gardening is natural if we do farming and gardening in a natural way. Then we're part of nature. If we feel like we're separate from nature and we need to control nature and dominate it and make it do what we want, that's not natural. Then we, then we don't feel like we're part of nature. We feel like we're separate from nature and there's where, there's where our problem is. So again, we need to develop ecological awareness. And part of ecological awareness, I believe, is opening your heart, feeling love for others, <coughs> feeling love for the environment, love for the ecosystems. Our Mother Earth, Gaia. Gaia is not a rock with a bit of bacteria on it. It's a living, conscious being. That would be the natural agriculture approach to the Earth. The Earth is a complex system of processes with rain and wind and things going on underground that all self-regulate. And we want to contribute to that and be in alignment with it and not fight it. If you're raising children and you feel like you're separate from them and you need to control them to make them become what you think they should be, how do you think your kids are going to turn out? What's that? Rebellious. Rebellious? Yeah. How, how, what else? Resentful. Resentful? Uh-huh. Maybe angry? Will they be loving, happy children that will contribute to society? Maybe, maybe not. What do kids need most, other than food? Love, love right, love. right, right. They need to feel loved. You may think you love them, but do they feel loved? It's important that they feel loved. If you're gardening and your plants feel loved, as Ben was saying, they're going to do really well. So if some people say this, this person has a green thumb and every plant they have in the house is growing really well, and you ask, well, what are you doing? What are you feeding them? Well, I water them, you know, and what, what else are you feeding them? Well, I don't know. Um, sometimes I get plant food. I usually forget to give them that, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you know, then you find out, oh, they talk to the plants, or they sing to them, or they, they pet them, they treat them like they're their children. As Ben was saying, you do that. If you feel that way, everything alive thrives with love, affection, and uh, appreciation. So if you, if, you, if you garden a farm that way, it'll make a big difference. I saw a film last year. It was in Japanese. It was about a farmer up in, I think it was Hokkaido in Japan. And his daughter died, and he was very depressed for a couple of years. And uh, he eventually got this insight. <laughs> he realized that, everything, that all these plants were alive. And that sounds like, well, yeah, of course they're alive. But when he said alive, he meant that they're intelligent, they're conscious, sensitive beings. And he started feeling very grateful that they were growing things, because he knew what life was because his daughter was no longer alive, in the usual sense. But th these plants are alive. And after being depressed for so long, he switched and started think thinking, thank you for being alive. And he just switched, and he, he didn't want to be depressed anymore. So he thought if he focused on uh, gratitude and appreciation, he could turn things around. So that became his practice. So every day when he was going around watering his plants, he would say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And his plants started doing really well. And it started doing so well that he had to hire more people. And he started training everyone in saying thank you. And they'd start out every day, all the workers get together in a circle, and they'd do a big group hug, and they'd sell thank you to each other, and say things of appreciation. And they all got in this really happy state of thank you, and became like the thank you farm. <laughs> and then they started having events because people love coming to buy their produce and they started having music and a festival and it was a really happy place and people came there they didn't even know why but I guess because it was a very happy place because if you focus on love and gratitude not only are you happy but it spreads so it became that was an amazing thing so with natural agriculture if you spread love and gratitude things do well so um, 12 minutes, uh-oh. Um, so not only are plants conscious, intelligent, and sensitive, but we believe that even the soil is conscious, intelligent, and sensitive.
So what does that mean? Is there any life in the soil? Do you, do you know? Is it just a bunch of rocks and dirt? I mean, what, what's inside the soil? There's bacteria. There's worms. There's fungi or fungus. There's a, and healthy food has lots of fungus. Fungus, they call it mycelium. Mycelium is a fungus underground. If you ever pulled out a root or stick that's been in the ground and you see all those white powdery stuff that's kind of stringy, that's called mycelium. It's the underground fungus. When the fungus pops up above ground, that's called a mushroom. The so mushroom is like, it's like the sex organs of the, the, the mushroom and, and, it's, uh, and they spit out spores. And healthy soil must have fungi or fungus in it. Fungi uh, produce, helps break down minerals that are then, uh, and other nutrients that are available to plants. And plants create sugars that feed the fungi, so it's a symbiotic relationship. When you, so that's part of the life in the soil. So if you, um, if you feel not only love for the plants that you can see, but the invisible life down below, that also is very important because it'll feed the fungi and the bacteria that have a symbiotic relationship with the plants. And then if you feel love for the, the water, the water that's irrigating your plants or the water that's raining down from the sky, according to this uh, researcher, Dr. Emoto, water also responds to our thoughts and feelings. Water that has love or gratitude, or appreciation to it, creates these beautiful hexagonal shapes, or like, sort of like snowflakes. And uh, that's, we're, not, we're like, what, 70% water? So when you feel that, your water is, the water inside you is changing, and the water in the soil is changing, the water in the atmosphere is changing. So love goes around everywhere. There's no boundaries for love. It goes everywhere, just like, just like smog, only <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> so anyway, that's part of natural agriculture, is feeding the soil with love and gratitude, because the soil is alive. But now, according to Mesh Sama, who created, uh, his name is Mokichi Okada, cr who created natural agriculture, even rocks are conscious and intelligent, and uh, probably in a very fundamental way. They may not be self-aware like living, like what we call living organisms, but there's, he says, fundamentally, we live in a conscious universe. Not in a dead universe that, in which there's a few living things, but it's a conscious universe which means everything responds to our thoughts and our thoughts affect everything in ways that we can't understand or can't imagine. So part of organic natural agriculture is trusting nature and doing it with love and gratitude. And with the natural agriculture garden or farm, you want to make it beautiful. Why would be, we want it to be beautiful? Because beauty affects our heart. If you see beauty around you, you tend to be happier. You tend to, it brings out the best in you. And it may bring out the best in the plants. Most wild nature has some beauty to it, but sometimes when humans come around, we mess it up. So you bring some beauty there to affect the mood, to make the plants happy, to make yourself happy. I'm running out of time, but a couple things I want to mention is, because uh, I don't have time to cover everything, uh, conventional crops oftentimes grow very tall and fast. But if you look at this one, its roots are rather shallow. Natural agriculture crops tend to be, they grow a little slower, but they're thicker and sturdier and they have a huge root base. Why was that important? Because there's all the minerals in the soil, so when you go deep, you get all these minerals, you'll find that the natural agriculture crops have more nutrition. They also withstand extreme weather, like droughts and floods and hurricanes, because of this deep root structure. If they get damaged, they can regrow better. Now, with conventional agriculture, oftentimes uh, the plants, the crops come up very fast, maybe 90% comes up right away, and then only maybe 10% comes later. With natural agriculture, they, they, let's say you have a strawberry plant. The strawberries come out more gradually over a period of time. Maybe 50% comes up now, and the rest come up over many, many weeks. It's not always as profitable to do natural agriculture farming as conventional because in farming or in growing fruits and vegetables, the first crop of the season gets the most money. Then after that, it goes down because more and more people enter. So it's a race. So anything you can do to push the things to grow stuff fast, give them all the pesticides and fertilizer you can to make it grow, you make a lot of money. But oftentimes, they have no taste and they have no nutrition, but they make a lot of money. So the, the capitalist system doesn't always support natural agriculture as well. But 
What's, what natural agriculture is promoting more and more is CSA programs, community supported agriculture, where you, you, uh, you subscribe to getting produce <coughs> shipped to you all the time. Now, do you want to get all your strawberries in one week, or would you rather have them for maybe two months? If you have your own garden, do you want to have broccoli for two weeks, or would you rather have it available for six months? See, for, for your own personal consumption, you want things to grow out for a longer period of time. If you're in a race to make a profit, you want it all to come up right away. But that's not very sustainable. So there's a difference. I don't have time to go into this, I'm sorry. This looks complicated, doesn't it? I hope the human philosophy conscious intelligence Okay, do we have any, any questions so far? Or comments? How much time we got? Yes, Ben. <laughs> well, I, how much time do I have? Five minutes? What is it? We can stay. We've got enough for about five minutes. No, we can't. And we can't. There's another thing happening, right? In the, in the other hall? Okay, I'm going to go fast, and you probably won't follow anything I'm saying. But anyway, there's three principal components of natural agriculture, which is pure seeds, pure soil, and pure heart. And what does that mean, pure heart? That means the pure heart of the farmer. When, uh, when we say someone has a pure heart, what does that mean? They're not greedy and aggressive. They're not trying to get their way all the time. That's a pure heart. You're not pushing your gender. You're not selfish. It also means you have love in your heart. So you, in order to do natural agriculture, you need seeds that are not hybrid or GMO. They don't have pesticides. They're not terminator seeds. And ideally, they're heirloom seeds that have been adapted to the soil. You want pure soil that has no contaminants in it. And that's a big topic we didn't get into. And again, the pure heart. Those are the essence. When you have all three, you get the ideal balance of the three here. This bigger circle is, in, is nature. It's all done within a, within a larger context of nature, which is ecological awareness. And again, all of nature, according to natural agriculture, is conscious, intelligent, and sensitive, just like, well, most everybody I know. Um, so <laughs> if you've got ecological awareness, you too are conscious, intelligent, and sensitive. So that's, that's how you want to do natural agriculture. And uh, if you have a natural agriculture garden, you'll probably find great joy and fulfillment from doing that. Comment uh, on the roots. I expect that you would find that organic would also have smaller root systems. Yes. Because we're pampering the soil somewhat. That's right. So again, there's so many things I didn't get into. I wanted to compare organic and natural agriculture more and talk about what happens when you put nutrients in the soil, such as compost. It's just running out of time. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. Have you heard of the, the city of water in Tokyo? Near Tokyo, in Japan. Does everybody live on boats? The, well, no. They just clean their water all the time, and it's been going on for many years. What do you mean they, they clean it? The city. I can't remember the Japanese. How do they place. clean it? What does that mean? Uh, they do it by waterfalls. You know, oh. it runs all through the city, and they have canals, and the same water comes. It recycles? Oh, yeah, uh -huh. always, and it goes through the whole city. I can't remember the Japanese name, hmm. but it's southeast, uh, uh, southwest of Tokyo. Okay, because Japan goes like that. Yeah, I can't remember the there's a There's an Austrian naturalist called Victor Schauberger that mm. studied ecological systems, and he found that water um, rejuvenates itself when it goes down a stream because it hits rocks and it mm. twists and yeah, turns, and all that moving do. does it. And if we were to, we have these big aqueducts and pipes that in cities that go straight for miles and miles and miles, mm. the water gets kind of dead. But if they were to cause the pipes to have little grooves that cause the water to spin, in the, it, it, would, it would be somewhat self-cleaning. It would be alive, it, uh, which is basically following nature. Nature doesn't have streams that go like that, like freeways. It wiggles, it bumps, it's got rocks, and it rejuvenates, gets rid of the bacteria, it becomes alive, it gets a life force to it. So waterfalls do that too. I'd be very fascinated to know about that. Thank you. We have lots of Japanese here. I'll have to do a survey. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any? Co yes. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge um, this message. It's, it's beautiful to learn about natural agriculture. It's a new concept for me. Um, mm -hmm. I work for, my name is Jessica, and I work for um, a nonprofit called Kiss the Ground. Nice. Oh. about regenerative agriculture, and this totally, it, you know, aligns with our work, yeah. and just really excited to 
to hear this message um, and hear you speak about We do have publications, by the way. Uh, our, probably our main textbook is called Spirit of the Land by Dinah Jerkins, and we have a publication table over there. I'll be over there selling it. This is like a textbook. The first half is the principles and practices. Second half is stories of farmers and what they've done. And there's this book called Farming to Create Heaven on Earth. This is, the writer is interviewing about a dozen farmers or gardeners in Japan, mostly Japan, about what they're doing with natural agriculture, their challenges, the things they learned. And you learn about these principles through a journey with this writer, because she doesn't know anything when she starts, and it's really fun to read. And this book, I'm the co-author of this book, called An Offering of Light, Healing with Jore, Natural Agriculture and Art, and, and there's a chapter here that deals with natural agriculture in more of a philosophical sense, but that's available too. And there's a little booklet here that has a small section on, it's a Q&A, question and answer, and it has information about natural agriculture. I'm the author of this one too. And we have brochures. I don't know how many we have left. This frequently asked questions about natural agriculture. It's question and answer. It's very nice, very well written. We have some here and there. If you can find <coughs> them, you may have to find, hire a scout to find them, but we have them around. <laughs> so thank you all for thank coming. You.